I just want to put this in the broadest context of PON and negotiation pedagogy at PON. Um, PON does lots of things. Um, Susan is sitting here and James is sitting here and they manage a very, very elaborate enterprise that has so many different things going on at the same time. But from the very beginning, one of the things PON has been concerned about is how to help people teach negotiation more effectively, how to teach negotiation, dispute resolution, conflict resolution uh, in academic context and how to use the same kinds of teaching materials in a training context. And from the beginning, we've had that as an interest. Uh, but it only um, evolves as long as people like yourselves who are connected to PON in one way or another um, have an interest in helping to uh, improve the thinking about negotiation pedagogy. Um, the, the focus on pedagogy goes in the directions that are reflected partly by what's happening in the world and partly by what individuals affiliated with PON want to do. Uh, in the, the last session we had, some of you were here, we started to ask, how do we know how good a job we're doing when we're teaching? Very straightforward question. You'd think that all of us who do teaching would be uh, self-conscious about how we assess how we're doing. And so uh, we tried uh, to get a running start on that question by interviewing a number of our colleagues. And uh, Lara has been a very important part of the team doing a lot of the interviewing. And then trying to summarize some of the interesting things from those interviews. It's not a statistical sample of all people teaching negotiation. It's, it's just exploratory to see if we could get at any kind of trends in what people are doing to try to assess how much their students are learning and how well they are teaching. Not just what they think would be nice, but what are they actually doing? And uh, as part of the organization of that fall session, Michael and I said, um, and partly reinforced by some things that were said at the session, um, you know, there's a lot of online instruction and negotiation going on. Some years ago, we had a seminar, and it was a you know, wildly unusual idea to teach negotiation. And we, had, we found two or three examples. And we had an evening discussion about those few examples. And now, um, it's quite uh, prevalent. And so uh, we wanted to come back to it. But we didn't want to just talk about what are people teach, doing who are teaching negotiation online. We wanted to take the same question from the fall and ask, how do you know whether this new mode of teaching is conveying the same things you wanted to teach. Uh, are people learning the same things in this new format as well, not as well? Are they learning different things because the format allows you to teach differently? Uh, and how are the faculty who are teaching online evaluating their performance as well as their students' performance. So this is part of the matched set with the fall where we were not thinking about online at all, just those same two questions in a classroom context. And this tonight, we're focusing on it in an online context. And you saw um, some of the highlights of the results of the interviews that we did. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Mike. There's so good to see folks. Oh, you're going to get this back, Larry, very, very quickly. All right. But we'll do the right. handoff. This is sort of like oh, a magic know. wand or something of that, <laughs> that sort. Good to see people, um, many of whom were at our earlier seance. Um, <laughs> I want to get to the end for me. And um, then we can kind of, with the bookends, fill in in the middle. Um, I think this is coming and coming fast. Um, and you know, once again, Melissa, um, being a, uh, a pioneer, saw this before I saw it. 
and saw it in a way that was intrigued and I think in many ways welcoming um, teaching in this environment. For people who have not done it, and I assume that's the majority here, um, you may believe the old adage, if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, I'm a bit of a contrarian, as some of you who have known me for a while. I've always liked thing, if it's not broke, break it. You know, And I'm serious about that, right? Um, because we can fall into habits and, and patterns. Um, I've had some experience in this realm now, having created with lots of help and lots of resources um, a 40-hour course. I'm pretty confident that we're going to see people who today have no interest in teaching online within several years doing some of it in conjunction with their traditional teaching. And it's almost inevitable in part because the technology has gotten so good in allowing interaction with students uh, back and forth with one another and with faculty or teaching assistants and, and so forth. It liberates us in many ways from schedules um, to the extent that these are asynchronous. It provides a platform for enabling things like journaling, which we've done for a long time, but in a much more systemic way in which material can be aggregated and reviewed by a faculty member much more efficiently than if they're getting 50 odd, uh, odd emails. So I can imagine somebody who, as I do, loves teaching in a conventional classroom, um, but can imagine ways in which that teaching can be enhanced and certain things that are being done in class can be equally effective online, which then opens up more of that precious class time uh, when you're together with your students. So I don't think I'm going way out on a limb to say that we're on the verge of something. And when I speak of teaching, I'm speaking not just of um, in degree courses in graduate schools, professional schools, but also in executive education as well. I can imagine, Polly, um, people coming to the Charles Hotel having already done something online. We do a very small version of that when I've got the putting it all together and people do a self-assessment survey and so, and so forth. I can imagine a rich opportunity for staying connected with those people with supplementary training and so forth. So if that's coming, wouldn't it be nice if we knew what works well in that environment, as well, better, not so well, so we can allocate our attention and the investment we make in our teaching and design this so that there is a very careful complementary um, experiences in person, live, and so forth with what happens online. I think that's coming, and I'm hoping that the program negotiation can take, after this session, Larry, um, a very proactive stance, I'm talking to you, Susan, in, in helping the rest of the world, um, rest of the teaching world, uh, think about the opportunities, choices, and obstacles that we face in um, staying up with uh, and taking advantage of emerging technology. So that's where I want to go at the end. And anything that we can do that gives us a little better clarity about what works well is to the good. I had conversations <coughs> both with David Lax and with John Hammond, who have been teaching negotiation for a while, um, um, about this, about the question of how one measures effectiveness. It's very challenging and very important. So let's have a conversation about it. And Larry, you get the, the button back. So as we started these interviews, we're talking to people who are teaching online. And they all have taught in a classroom style before they did anything online. So is assessing student learning different in an online environment? You just give the same test online that you gave at the end of an in-person class or you don't use a test. You use some observation of something. Do you use the same observation of people doing things online? And again, Michael hinted at this, but let me be very explicit about it. There are online platforms, I'm the one I use at MIT, 
in which uh, people negotiate with other people face to face every week. It, it's like Skype, but you don't make a call. And there's no charge, and it's really good quality. And so you are assigned someone somewhere else in the world who you don't know, but who's taking the course, and you have confidential instructions assigned to you, and they have the other part, just like you would in a classroom, and you do the negotiation. And the question is, well, right, what do you do in a regular class to assess whether people learned what they were supposed to learn from that negotiation? And do you do the same thing at the end of the online activity? And of course, we have different forms of online courses, some where the faculty members are involved on live during the online course, and others where it's all been pre-recorded, and the faculty members know where to be found during the time the online course is done. They're just in the video, they're in the design of the course, they're in the creation of the feedback mechanisms, but they're all designed the way they are. Might be a live TA who's involved with dealing with the people who are taking the course in real time in a chat type interaction, but how do you assess this? And what pedagogical practices and teaching tools could be borrowed from online? And the point that Mike was making, and those of you who haven't taught online may not appreciate it because it went by very quickly, you have a lot of documentation of what everybody does throughout the course and every aspect of things, and it's in the machine. And you can press a button and say, show me this person's reflections from the beginning of the class to the end. And if you develop the right uh, set of questions or the right template, you can say, show me the answer to question three which is as they're accumulating their learning, what do they think they've most learned to do better or not? And you can get a story for every student by pressing a button, right? Try going through all those journals, right? It's harder. So there is a series of possibilities where the things that we're being forced to design to teach online might actually help us in classroom context, and we wanted to know about that. So, the first thing is, all online teaching of negotiation is not the same, okay? There are fully automated courses with no live element, and it's as if you just went uh, on the web, said I wanna take a negotiation course, you found one, and you were enrolled in it, and it un unfurled as it went along, and probably did not have any interactions with other people doing it. You just did it on your own time. So I'm in category one, but people do a series of negotiations. There's a lot of chat. Um, there's a lot of feedback, peer feedback, and so forth. So the, what's missing is the know-it-all instructor. Uh, other than canned recordings, in my case, more than 100 of very short uh, snippets. So, so no live element, I, uh, when we concocted that, Larry, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear, I meant no live presence of, of an right. instructor. Whereas in your course, once a week, correct, um, there actually is something that's presented and people know when to tune in on that. If they can't, they can see a recording of it. Right. One is the professor, the other is interaction with other students. That's right. right. Um, or a teacher. Negotiation. And you can have one or both. Right. right. Exactly. And, and so that's why that, you know, the two mics you have no live element to do, but in your course, there's live. That's right. So they're not watching a 40 exactly. hour movie. Exactly. Right. But on, some online classes are, and to the extent there's any interactivity, there's some tweaked AI version of, uh, you know, scripted. Uh, Mm -hmm. the, this, this, that's, thank you, Dave, that's very helpful. The, the issue is whether the learner 
does this at their own place, at their own time, when they want, or whether they, in fact, have to be doing it on a schedule with other people who are doing it on the same schedule. And even though they're online, if they're on the same schedule, there's a chance of having live interaction between the students. Kind of hard, you could do it, but kind of hard to have line inter live interaction amongst the students in a non-synchronous course. It's conceivable you could invent some way of storing up possible people who are ready whenever someone says they want to negotiate with somebody, but we're talking about a course that is either the person doing it when they want, as they want, and it's all prepackaged, or whether it's prepackaged but it's given at a certain time each during the year and all the people taking it are taking it together. And I, I'm, that's a description of something taught all over the place. Now we also have people who are teaching to their students in their university an online course. Not to anybody who happens to sign up. A lot of cor online courses use polls constantly, electronic polls. And they ask lots of questions, not about the substance, but how are you doing? How is it going? Is this understandable? Do you so far have a clear understanding of the material in, that you read? And those polls publish their results in real time. And if there's a TA watching, then the TA can alert the faculty member and say, I know you're not, you think you're not going to be involved in this course, which is all pre-made and online, but there's a problem. And at that point, you, we may say, the system isn't working the way it's supposed to. People aren't learning what they're supposed to learn. Even though you said you had no face-to-face -face involvement, you've got to get involved, or at least you have to have a TA who can fix things. Um, and I, I know for myself, um, I, w I believe in real-time feedback in the form of reflective commentary, whether you call it a journal or whatever it is. And after people do and some activity, I want to give them a set of questions and ask them to record their results. And then I want them to look at those over time, and I usually would look at them over time. But online, I'm not going to do that. So then I decided I was going to have them be co-learners, co-instructors, and create a mechanism where they gave each other some sense of feedback over time, and I would force myself to construct <laughs> what I would have looked at in the form of a template and, and get them to do it. But then when you get to the end of the course and you say, well, now look back. And what do you now feel you have mastered and what do you feel you haven't mastered? Uh, and what are you going to set for yourself as a continuing learning program in light of that? I'm not in that story. I don't, I don't know a way online to really be in that story very well.